Question 70 of Summa Theologica Pars Prima on the Angels and on the Six Days. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kelly Weiskel. Summa Theologica Pars Prima on the Angels and on the Six Days by St. Thomas Aquinas translated by the fathers of the english dominican province question seventy of the work of adornment as regards the fourth day in three articles we must next consider the work of adornment first as to each day by itself secondly as to all seven days in general in the first place then we consider the work of the fourth day secondly that of the fifth day thirdly that of the sixth day and fourthly, such matters as belong to the seventh day. Under the first head, there are three points of inquiry. 1. As to the production of the lights. 2. As to the end of their production. 3. Whether they are living beings. First Article Whether the lights ought to have been produced on the fourth day. Objection 1. It would seem that the lights ought not to have been produced on the fourth day, for the heavenly luminaries are by nature incorruptible bodies, wherefore their matter cannot exist without their form. But as their matter was produced in the work of creation, before there was any day, so therefore were their forms. It follows, then, that the lights were not produced on the fourth day. Objection 2. Further, the luminaries are, as it were, vessels of light. But light was made on the first day. The luminaries, therefore, should have been made on the first day, not the fourth. Objection 3. Further, the lights are fixed in the firmament, as plants are fixed in the earth. For, the scripture says, He set them in the firmament. But plants are described as produced when the earth to which they are attached, received its form. The lights, therefore, should have been produced at the same time as the firmament, that is to say, on the second day. Objection 4. Further, plants are an effect of the sun, moon, and other heavenly bodies. Now, cause precedes effect in the order of nature. The lights, therefore, ought not to have been produced on the fourth day, but on the third day. Objection 5. Further, as astronomers say, there are many stars larger than the moon. Therefore, the sun and the moon alone are not correctly described as the two great lights. On the contrary, suffices the authority of Scripture. I answer that. In recapitulating the divine works, Scripture says, Genesis 2.1, So the heavens and the earth were finished in all the furniture of them, thereby indicating that the work was threefold. In the first work, that of creation, the heaven and the earth were produced, but as yet without form. In the second, or work of distinction, the heaven and the earth were perfected, either by adding substantial form to formless matter, as Augustine holds, or by giving them the order and the beauty due to them, as other holy writers suppose. To these two works is added the work of adornment, which is distinct from perfect. For the perfection of the heaven and the earth regards, seemingly, those things that belong to them intrinsically. But the adornment, those that are extrinsic, just as the perfection of a man lies in his proper parts and forms, and his adornment and clothing are such like. Now just as distinction of certain things is made most evident by their local movement, as separating one from another, so the work of adornment is set forth by the production of things having movement in the heavens and upon the earth. But it has been stated above, in question 69, that three things are recorded as created, namely, the heaven, the water, and the earth and these three receive their form from three days of work of distinction, so that heaven was formed on the first day, on the second day the waters were separated, and on the third day 
and the earth was divided into sea and dry land. So also is it in the work of adornment, on the first day of this work, which is the fourth of creation, are produced the lights, to adorn the heaven by their movements. On the second day, which is the fifth, birds and fishes are called into being, to make beautiful the intermediate element, for they move in air and water, which are here taken as one. While on the third day, which is the sixth, animals are brought forth, to move upon the earth and adorn it. It must also here be noted that Augustine's opinion on the production of lights is not at variance with that of other holy writers, since he says that they were made actually, and not merely virtually. For the firmament has not the power of producing lights, as the earth has of producing plants. Wherefore, Scripture does not say, Let the firmament produce lights, though it says, Let the earth bring forth the green herb. Reply, Objection 1. In Augustine's opinion, there is no difficulty here, for he does not hold a succession of time in these works, and so there was no need for the matter of the lights to exist under another form. Nor is there any difficulty in the opinions of those who hold the heavenly bodies to be of the nature of the four elements, for it may be said that they were formed out of matter already existing, as animals and plants were formed. For those, however, who hold the heavenly bodies to be of another nature from the elements, and naturally incorruptible, the answer must be that the lights were substantially created at the beginning, but that their substance, at first formless, is formed on this day, by receiving not its substantial form, but a determination of power, as to the fact that the lights are not mentioned as existing from the beginning, but only as made on the fourth day. Chrysostom explains this by the need of guarding the people from the danger of idolatry, since the lights are proved not to be gods by the fact that they were not from the beginning. Reply Objection 2 no difficulty exists if we follow Augustine in holding the lights made on the first day to be spiritual, and that made on this day to be corporeal. If, however, the lights made on the first day is understood to be itself corporeal, then it must be held to have been produced on that day merely as light in general, and that on the fourth day the lights received a definite power to produce determinate effects. Thus we observe that the rays of the sun have one effect, those of the moon another, and so forth. Hence speaking of such a determination of power, Dionysius says that the sun's light, which previously was without form, was formed on the fourth day. Reply Objection 3 According to Ptolemy, the heavenly luminaries are not fixed in the spheres, but have their own movement distinct from the movement of the spheres. Wherefore, Chrysostom says that he is said to have set them in the firmament, not because he fixed them there immovably, but because he bade them to be there, even as he placed man in paradise to be there. In the opinion of Aristotle, however, the stars are fixed in their orbits, and in reality have no other movements but that of the spheres, and yet our senses perceive the movement of the luminaries and not that of the spheres. But Moses describes what is obvious to sense out of condescension to popular ignorance, as we have already said. Question 67, answer 4. Question 68, answer 3. The objection, however, falls to the ground if we regard the firmament made on the second day as having a natural distinction from that in which the stars are placed. Even though the distinction is not apparent to the senses, the testimony of which Moses follows as stated above, for although to the senses there appears to be one firmament, if we admit a higher and lower firmament, the lower will be that which was made on the second day, and on the fourth the stars were fixed in the higher firmament. Reply Objection 4 In the words of Basil, plants were recorded as produced before the sun and moon to prevent idolatry, since those who believe the heavenly bodies to be gods hold that plants originate primarily from these bodies. Although, as Chrysostom remarks, the sun, moon, and stars cooperate in the work of production by their movements, as the husbandman cooperates by his labor. Reply Objection 5 As Chrysostom says, the two lights are called great, 
not so much with regard to their dimensions as to their influence and power for though the stars be of greater bulk than the moon yet the influence of the moon is more perceptible to the senses in this lower world moreover as far as the senses are concerned its apparent size is greater second article question seventy article two whether the cause assigned for the production of lights is reasonable objection one it would seem that the cause assigned for the production of lights is not reasonable for it is said jeremiah ten two be not afraid of the signs of heaven which the heathens fear therefore the heavenly lights were not made to be signs objection two further sign is contradistinguished from cause but the lights are the cause of what takes place upon the earth therefore they are not signs objection three further the distinction of seasons and days began from the first day therefore the lights were not made for seasons days and years that is in order to distinguish them objection four further nothing is made for the sake of that which is inferior to itself since the end is better than the means but the lights are nobler than the earth therefore they were not made to enlighten it objection five further the new moon cannot be said to rule the night but such it probably did when first made for men begin to count from the new moon the moon therefore was not made to rule the night on the contrary suffices the authority of scripture i answer that as we have said above question sixty five answer two a corporeal creature can be considered as made either for the sake of its proper act or for other creatures or for the whole universe or for the glory of god of these reasons only that which points out the usefulness of these things to man is touched upon by moses in order to withdraw his people from idolatry hence it is written deuteronomy four nineteen lest perhaps lifting up thy eyes to heaven thou see the sun and the moon and all the stars of heaven and being deceived by error thou adore and serve them which the lord thy god created for the service of all nations now he explains this service at the beginning of genesis as threefold first the lights are of service to man in regard to sight which directs him in his works and is most useful for perceiving objects in reference to this he says let them shine in the firmament and give life to the earth secondly as regards to the changes of the seasons which prevent weariness preserve health and provide for the necessities of food all of which things could not be secured if it were always summer or winter in reference to this he says let them be for seasons and for days and years thirdly as regards the convenience of business and work in so far as the lights are set in the heavens to indicate fair or foul weather as favorable to various occupations and in this respect he says let them be for signs reply objection one the lights in the heaven are set for signs of changes affected in corporeal creatures but not of those changes which depend upon the free will reply objection two we are sometimes brought to the knowledge of hidden effects through their sensible causes and conversely hence nothing prevents a sensible cause from being a sign but he says signs rather than causes to guard against idolatry reply objection three the general division of time into day and night took place on the first day as regards the diurnal movement which is common to the whole heaven and may be understood to have begun on that first day but the particular distinctions of days and seasons and years according as one day is hotter than another one season than another and one year than another are due to certain particular movements of the stars which movements may have had their beginnings on the fourth day reply objection four light was given to the earth for the service of man who by reason of his soul is nobler than the heavenly bodies nor is it untrue to say that a higher creature may be made for the sake of a lower considered not in itself but as ordained to the good of the universe reply objection five 
when the moon is at its perfection it rises in the evening and sets in the morning and thus it rules the night and it was probably made in its full perfection as were plants yielding seed as also were animals and man himself for although the perfect is developed from the imperfect by natural process yet the perfect must exist simply before the imperfect augustine however does not say this for he says that it is not unfitting that god made things imperfect which he afterwards perfected third article question seventy article three whether the lights of heaven are living beings objection one it would seem that the lights of heaven are living beings for the nobler a body is the more nobly it should be adorned but a body less noble than the heavens is adorned with living beings with fish birds and the beast of the field therefore the lights of heaven as pertaining to its adornment should be living beings also objection to further the nobler a body is the nobler must be its form but the sun moon and stars are nobler bodies than plants or animals and must therefore have nobler forms now the noblest of all forms is the soul as being the first principle of life hence augustine says every living substance stands higher in the order of nature than one that has not life the lights of heaven therefore are living beings objection three further a cause is nobler than its effect but the sun moon and stars are a cause of life as is especially evidenced in the case of animals generated from putrefaction which receive life from the power of the sun and the stars much more therefore have the heavenly bodies a living soul objection four further the movement of the heavens and the heavenly bodies are natural and natural movement is from an intrinsic principle now the principle of movement in the heavenly bodies is a substance capable of apprehension and is moved as the desire is moved by the object desired therefore seemingly the apprehending principle is intrinsic to the heavenly bodies and consequently they are living beings objection five further the first of movables is the heaven now of all things that are endowed with movement the first moves itself as is proved in physics eight text thirty four because what is such of itself precedes that which is by another but only beings that are living move themselves as is shown in the same book text twenty seven therefore the heavenly bodies are living beings on the contrary damothine says let no one esteem the heavens or the heavenly bodies to be living things for they have neither life nor sense i answer that philosophers have differed on this question anaxagoras for instance as augustine mentions was condemned by the athenians for teaching that the sun was a fiery mass of stone and neither a god nor even a living being on the other hand the platonist held that the heavenly bodies have life nor was there less diversity of opinion among the doctors of the church it was the belief of origin and jerome that these bodies were alive and the latter seems to explain that the sense of the words ecclesiastics one six the spirit goeth forward surveying all places round about but basil and damascene maintain that the heavenly bodies are inanimate augustine leaves the matter in doubt without committing himself to either theory though he goes so far as to say that if the heavenly bodies are really living beings their souls must be akin to the angelic nature in examining the truth of this question where such diversity of opinion exists we shall do well to bear in mind that the union of soul and body exists for the sake of the soul and not of the body for the form does not exist for the matter but the matter for the form now the nature and power of the soul are apprehended through its operation which is to a certain extent its end yet for some of these operations as sensation and nutrition our body is a necessary instrument hence it is clear that the sensitive and nutritive souls must be united to a body in order to exercise their functions there are however operations of the soul which are not exercised through the medium of the body though the body ministers as it were to their production 
The intellect, for example, makes use of the phantasms derived from bodily senses, and thus far is dependent on the body, although capable of existing apart from it. It is not, however, possible that the functions of nutrition, growth, and generation, through which the nutritive soul operates, can be exercised by the heavenly bodies, for such operations are incompatible with the body naturally incorruptible. Equally impossible is it that the functions of the sensitive soul can appertain to the heavenly body, since all the senses depend on the sense of touch, which perceives elemental qualities, and all the organs of the senses require a certain proportion in the admixture of elements. Whereas the nature of heavenly bodies is not elemental, it follows, then, that of the operations of the soul the only ones left to be attributed to the heavenly bodies are those of understanding and moving. For appetite follows both sensitive and intellectual perception, and is in proportion thereto. But the operations of the intellect which does not act through the body do not need a body as their instrument, except to supply phantasms through the senses. Moreover, the operations of the sensitive soul, as we have seen, cannot be attributed to the heavenly bodies. Accordingly, the union of a soul to a heavenly body cannot be for the purpose of the operations of the intellect. It remains, then, only to consider whether the movement of the heavenly bodies demands a soul as a motive power, not that the soul, in order to move the heavenly body, need be united to the latter as its form, but by contact of power, as a mover is united to that which he moves. Therefore, Aristotle, after showing that the first mover is made up of two parts, the moving and the moved, goes on to show the nature of the union between these two parts. This, he says, is affected by contact which is mutual. If both are bodies, on the part of one only, if one is a body and the other not, the Platonists explain the union of soul and body in the same way, as a contact of a moving power with the object moved. And since Plato holds the heavenly bodies to be living beings, this means nothing else but that substances of spiritual nature are united to them, and act as their moving power, a proof that the heavenly bodies are moved by the direct influence and contact of some spiritual substance, and not, like bodies of specific gravity, by nature, lies in the fact that whereas nature moves to one fixed end, which having attained it rest, this does not appear in the movement of heavenly bodies. Hence it follows that they are moved by some intellectual substances. Augustine appears to be of the same opinion when he expresses his belief that all corporeal things are ruled by God through the spirit of life. From what has been said then, it is clear that the heavenly bodies are not living beings of the same sense as plants and animals, and that if they are called so it can only be equivocally. It will also be seen that the difference of opinion between those who affirm and those who deny that these bodies have life is not a difference of things, but of words. Reply Objection 1 Certain things belong to the adornment of the universe by reason of their proper movement, and in this way the heavenly luminaries agree with others that conduce to that adornment, for they are moved by a living substance. Reply Objection 2 One being may be nobler than another absolutely, but not in a particular respect. Well, then, it is not conceded that the souls of heavenly bodies are nobler than the souls of animals absolutely. It must be conceded that they are superior to them with regard to their respective forms, since their form perfects their matter entirely, which is not in potentiality to other forms, whereas a soul does not do this. Also, as regards movement, the power that moves the heavenly bodies is of a nobler kind. Reply Objection 3 since the heavenly body is a mover moved, it is of the nature of an instrument, which acts in virtue of the agent, and therefore, since this agent is a living substance, the heavenly body can impart life in virtue of that agent. Reply Objection 4. The movements of the heavenly bodies are natural, not on account of their active principle, but on account of their passive principle, that is to say, from a certain natural aptitude for being moved by an intelligent power. Reply Objection 5. The heaven is said to move itself in as far as it is compounded, a mover and moved, 
not by the union of the mover, as the form, with the moved, as the matter, but by contact with the motive power, as we have said. So far, then, the principle that moves it may be called intrinsic, and consequently its movement natural with respect to that active principle. Just as we say that voluntary movement is natural to the animal as animal. End of question 70. Recording by Kelly Weiskel.